Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us for what may be my favorite work that I've moderated in all of the festivals we've done. Uh, since Vaughn and I are both educators and I've been Zooming for a while, I think you're in good hands uh, for this panel. Welcome to our virtual uh, Six Bridges Book Festival. Uh, we're glad you've joined us this Sunday afternoon. Before I introduce the author, let me get some housekeeping out of the way. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question uh, during this session, please open your chat box and you can type it in there. It'll come to me and I'll be keeping an eye on the questions when we get to the Q&A portion and try to do them in order uh, and get to as many as I can. I'll start out with a few and then we'll get the ball rolling. I'd also like to thank Justin Best, Lauren E. Dixon and all of the Zoom squad technical support. They've been great as we've been prepping for this panel and throughout the festival. Thank you to all of you. Uh, so let's get to it. Vaughn Scribner is an associate professor of British American history at the University of Central Arkansas. He is the author of In Civility, I-N-N, -N, uh, Urban Taverns and Early American Civil Society. And we are talking about the book, Mer People, A Human History, a gorgeous, gorgeous book with over 117 beautiful striking images that Vaughn is gonna share a few with us. Um, people have been fascinated by uh, mer people and merfolk since ancient times. And this book will go through that whole human history. So without further ado, I'm gonna to toss it over to Vaughn. Hey all, thanks so much, Philip. Um, first off, I'm, I'm struggling. I woke up this morning battling a, well, I didn't wake up this morning. I actually woke up at like 1130 battling a sinus infection. So if I like stumble over a word or something, it's, I have, I've had my Zycam and everything else. So I think I'm gonna be okay. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen here. First off, also thank you all for attending. I can't wait to talk to you guys about this. I could talk for hours about Mer people as some of my colleagues could attest and my wife, um, my family. Uh, but I'm gonna keep my presentation rather short today, 15, 20 minutes so we can have question time. And I think you'll see that in some of my images and some of the things I talk about, they'll invite further discussion. Um, I'm going to be working off of a PowerPoint that I actually created for a 50 minute talk, but I'm going to be just picking and choosing certain slides and certain images to show you all. So if I, not if, when I skip over some slides, that's why I'm always happy to go back to something later on to answer a question, which I probably will. So I'm going to share my screen here. There we go. All right. So I'm going to present. Do, do, do. All right, can you all see that okay, I hope? Looks great. Great, was it full screen for you all too? Good, okay. So as you see here, my book's title. Now, as Philip mentioned, and I, this isn't me trying to be silly at all. What I wanna stress is that how well the publisher did on this book. It's the kind of book that until you pick it up and look at it, you can't really understand. It's, it's heavy, it's glossy pages. They really spared no expense and it's incredible that they can keep it, reaction books can keep it at this price with this many color, color illustrations. It's just, I couldn't be happier with how they did the book itself. So barring what's actually in it, the book itself is incredible. Um, and I, I'm just really proud of what they did with that. Now, the question I always have to kind of, before I get even in anything else, I have to answer this question like, why, why this? And even when the publisher reached out to me to write this book, they said, we noticed you, I had one article, I had an article on mer people in an academic journal that I'll get to and I done a couple of blog posts, but like Philip said, my first book was on early American taverns. I published numerous articles and everything ranging from mineral spring spas to Caribbean enslavement to environmental history. Um, where do mermaids come in? Well, in my research in colonial American history, mainly 18th century, I have to read a lot of travel journals and diaries and newspaper articles. And five years ago now, which is insane thinking about that, I was reading through the journal of a 17th century naturalist named John Jocelyn Englishman. And he was in Virginia. And out of nowhere in his diary, he said that a merman clambered up onto the side of his canoe in a river and, he is, and his men cut its arm off and it bled purple blood and sunk into the depths. And then he just kept going. And I was like, what is this? So I kind of made a note, like, I'm gonna come back to this. There's, there's something here. The very next day I'm reading Ben Franklin's Pennsylvania Gazette. And in a mid 18th century article that he published, 
Franklin, one of our enlightened founding fathers, published an account of a merman in France. At this point, I said, okay, I've got to dive into this, pun intended. And I started doing research. And initially, this turned into a blog post that I wrote for an early Americanist blog, actually two, where I was able to trace back to the source to figure out that John Smith never saw a mermaid, as has been numerous historians have said that, but if you have sources, it was attributed. Um, I wrote an academic, more an academic piece for a journal called Itinerario, which was looking at how Enlightenment men, um, mainly men, were chasing mer people around the world. This eventually turned into what you see here, um, in a different form of it, the, it ended up being the cover story of history today. Things just kind of started rolling um, because there's a lot of interest in mer people and there always has been. And that kind of takes me to, and then, oh, I have this, you see this text up here, it's almost impossible to read. Uh, this is from Cotton Mather, a 17th century New Englander, who in this incredible letter says that he now believes in mer people. You will not believe how many people not just said they've seen mer people in human history, but believe in them. And this is kind of the main thesis of my work. And that I, I will, I've told many people multiple times that mer people are everywhere. This book uses mer people to gain a deeper understanding of one of the most mysterious, capricious, and dangerous creatures on earth, humans. So I argue in this book basically that you can, how we have, whenever and wherever we have existed, we have found mer people. The way that we have found them, how we have represented them, our conceptions of them, our fears and hopes and desires surrounding them tells us just as much about us as humans as it does about these fantastical creatures. In doing this, I had to go beyond my temporal and geographical boundaries. My exper expertise is, it always feels weird saying that, is in 18th century colonial America slash England mostly. Well, all of a sudden in this book, I was tasked with writing something that goes back to ancient history up to the modern day. As I mentioned in my, um, in my, uh, can't think of a word for this, my acknowledgements, I couldn't have written this book 20 years ago. Not only would I have been in adolescence at this time, but the internet allowed me to connect with so many different people from around the world to find all kinds of sources, the digital sources today. I was able to pour through medieval manuscripts uh, from the comfort of my home. I mean, they'll do incredible word searches and just really pull out a lot of things. And I, I cannot stress how much fun I had writing this book and I hope it comes through in the book itself. Now, as you see here on this slide, you have through, throughout human history, you have mer people, especially mermaids more recently, springing up everywhere from cathedrals to coffee houses. Three different mer mermaids here from three different time periods and places. On the far left is a, what was termed a twin-tailed siren. It was drawn in the early 15th century. This was published in the 1960s. Starbucks, as you see, perfectly ripped that off for their original logo. Now, it itself was ripped off from something like this far right. This was from the roof boss in the Exeter Cathedral. This is an early 14th century example of a mermaid. Now, I show these three, not only because of their similarity, but this just the ubiquity of mer people. The largest chain coffee chain in the world has a mer person or mermaid in this case as its main icon. And I would even argue that English churches still today, churches throughout not just England, but Western Europe are littered with mer people. I led a study abroad trip to the UK two summers ago now, and we visited various cathedrals and I would always challenge my students with finding a mermaid and they never failed. They would oftentimes would find multiple actually. Now you might say, why, what, what's going on here? Well, I found that mer people far predate Christianity. As you see here, this is an eighth century BCE instance of Owns in this instance, it's a Syrian. He, he is depicted as a merman. That's a wall relief. You of course also have Odysseus at the ship's mast. Now these were sirens, they weren't mer people. We're still not totally sure why they gained fish tails. Um, I probably argue that it's something to do with the mysteries of the sea, sea monsters. But what I will say is that the Christian church, I'm gonna kind of skip ahead here, largely in the medieval period creates our modern idea of a merman. The merman kind of gets taken aside, although you still do find some mermen, mer monks oftentimes, they're fully covered. Here's the thing about mermaids in the early Christian church. They would have been some of the only 
depictions of topless women that you're going to see in anything to do with the church this time. They were very sexualized images. Um, I would argue that they were a way to kind of decenter the feminine in the Christian church, to stress the dangers of femininity in women, um, and, and also the connections to the, the dangers of sea. So you see three different examples here from the medieval period. The top one is another twin-tailed siren. And an especially graphic example, I found instances of the twin-tailed siren actually, um, I mean, it's, it kind of speaks for itself what's going on there. Um, and then on these, these bottom images, you have women in, in very lustful forms there. On the bottom left, they are trying to lure sailors in the depths. And on the bottom right, she is depicted um, in a pretty lurid form in one of these bestiaries that were drawn by Christian monks with her mirror and comb in hand, representing vanity, representing the dangers of feminine flesh. So the church, though, in trying to create this anti-feminine message, what happens over time is different people take this image and use it for different purposes. Now, I'm not going to go into every one, but this is a map I drew of God, Europeans' interactions with merpeople. If I'm correct, the blue is pre-17th -se pre century, the uh, black is 17th century, and the red is 18th century. Basically, what you're seeing here is at anywhere and everywhere Europeans start to go, they start to find merpeople. Uh, these are all verified sightings from primary sources throughout these geographical locations. I also want to stress that merpeople sightings are becoming more and more ubiquitous, and as the centuries progress, they're starting to become more um, verified, uh, not just through text, but also through imagery. For instance, this merman on the left was allegedly seen by a Canadian priest in, or sorry, French priest in Canada, and he drew the merman here up in the, this was seen in a lake. Here on the right, you have a depiction of Richard Whitmore, an Englishman finding mermaids in Newfoundland. Now you see here that the one on your left is a much more grotesque feature, more animalistic, while the ones on the right are more in tune with classic church depictions of a mermaid. Keep going. Now, this is the thing. I could have shown way more of these, but these are three very trusted Europeans in the 16th century arguing that they see mermaids. You have Columbus who said that he found mermaids not so beautiful as they were painted. Okay, so not in this traditional kind of Christian, you know, classic form. He said this in 1493 off the coast of America, and well, the Caribbean. He conceded that to some extent they have the form of a human face. In 1523, the Swiss philosopher Conrad Gessner contended that he, he saw uh, a man fish about the size of a boy at Rome. And in 1533, the Spaniard Diego Hurtado claimed to encounter a merman off the coast of Polynesia seen by all the crew, and this is important because he's saying, I'm not the only one, this was verified, near a deserted island, 30 leagues from the continent. The merman leapt about in the water like a monkey with his eyes fixed on the crew like a creature endued with reason. I have more and more of these. I have dozens, if not tens of dozens of these accounts. And the interesting thing is they're not depicting them as we would think of like a dugong or a seal or a manatee. Oftentimes they are, they are depicting them, especially as the 17th and 18th centuries progress in very human forms. Now, as the um, 15th century progresses also in the 16th century, you have mer people springing up on maps of the world all over the place. I'm not gonna dive into this too much. I would argue that it is a combination of, they're oftentimes they're appearing in the far reaches of the world, which made sense in early modern people's uh, manifestations of the world as the farther you one got from civilization, the more and more monstrosities and creatures one would find. They're also decorative, um, but their, their, their sheer, once again, ubiquity uh, speaks to something. By the Enlightenment period, um, I'm not gonna, you have, uh, which is the 18th century, roughly, especially in Western Europe, now you have scientists, or they weren't scientists at the time, they called themselves naturalists or philosophers, taking these modern, in their minds, um, ideas of science, philosophy, reason, and applying them to these otherwise fantastical creatures, including mermaids. Um, you see that the, 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 they're arguing that they have hands, ribs, and other portions of the skeletons of mermaids. One cultural sex England held the rib of a triton or merman in his private collection. Um, Patrick Gordon claimed to have viewed mermaid hands in the repository, repository of natural rarities at Leiden and in the Museum Regium at Copenhagen. The Royal Society of London held multiple mermaid pieces as well, but it wasn't just skeletons because especially beginning in the 18th century, you have these scientific drawings 
of art of people who are saying these are specimens. Now, of course, the specimens were already dead always. They're, they already died by the time images came out of them. But you have here two examples. 1754, this is the Siren and Louis Renard's Poisons et Crivisa. I can't, I'm not good at French. I'm not even, gonna, it's a French book on, the interesting thing about this one is Renard, all, this is a, basically a book all about uh, creatures in the ocean, fish, um, um, you know, crabs, etc. She was placed right around all other realistic, real verified creatures. Now, some people ridiculed him for this, while others embraced it. He argued that he found her off in the East Indies. He said that she looked like one of the locals. They kept her in a tank for a while, all, but she wouldn't eat and she died. This one on the right is another French example by uh, Diagoti, a mermaid with a measuring scale. Apparently this was exhibited in Paris. Um, you see too, this one's important. It was exhibited as quite ugly by, by standards at the time, very animalistic. There is a scale next to it as if it's an, an, a specimen to show its size. And they even, interestingly, again, they use this, it's published, republished in London's Gentleman's Magazine, which was a very scientific, highbrow magazine. And the very next month, they published another image of a mermaid allegedly caught off the coast of England, but they depicted her in ideas of white femininity, femininity and beauty. And they tried to argue that there were white mermaids and that there were black mermaids. And this one here was an instance of a black mermaid. And they tried to ascribe blossoming, blossoming ideas of race on mer people as well. So we're just to step back a minute here, we're seeing that as mer people progress and as humans, I wouldn't say progress, but continue, they're, they're finding what they're looking for in mer people, whether it's the age of exploration where they want to find them in new worlds, or by now it's the enlightenment, they want to kind of apply some reason or, or order to nature. It's no coincidence that Linnaeus, the father of modern classification, was running all around the earth writing letters to the Swedish Academy saying, we've heard of mermaids, we need to find these. Now, by the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century, you have this age of freak shows and fantasies coming about. Um, the 19th century especially is when the peak and the valley of belief in mer people happens. Now, my favorite image here I just wanna look into is this is actually from the end of the 19th century, but this is important to see because you see that by the end of the 19th century, the Illustrated Police News here runs uh, an advertisement, this is a London magazine, for the mermaid at the Westminster Aquarium. By this time, they're calling manatees mermaids, but they also give a history of mermaids. These ideal mermaids, you know, originally cultivated by the Christian church, the dugong carrying a young, they're arguing that could be depicted as a mermaid, and then these Japanese ideas of mermaids as well. These Japanese ideas of mermaids are really important because by the end of the 18th and to the early 19th century, Europeans start making their way into East Asia, especially Japan. They're welcomed in as traders finally. And the Japanese start selling them what we now call the, they, they called Nino, which were little dried up specimens. They were made with metal paper mache stitching. It was the bottom half of a fish and the top half of a monkey screwed together in this way. Now, as sailors were going over here, they were looking, they believed in mer people a lot of them, or they were they're looking to find them there. And they started buying them and bringing them back to Europe and eventually America, saying that they found them, they found mer people. Now in the 19th century, I um, kind of figured out, I, I read through, th I, I went to newspapers.com as well as the New York Times and various other website repositories. And I typed in mermaid and I went through every article that came back. In newspapers.com alone, there was something like 9,000, I think, articles in the 19th century. I went through every article and I developed this graph and, ch and charts and I was the most math I ever wanted to do. But I developed three basically phases in the 19th century of mer people interest. Between 1800 and 1822, we have this idea that people in the, in, in the West especially are still wedded to enlightenment ideas with a constant spate of newspaper articles on mer people. Um, between this time, there would have been no fewer than at least four articles every year that came out of verified mer people sightings or specimens. Between 1822 and 1845, we get boom and bust years with, an with continuing this average of four mer people articles per year and a craze for these Fiji mermaid specimens, which, which were these Nino that I was talking about earlier. So Europeans call them Fiji mermaids, which ultimately damn belief, as we'll see. 
finally, between 1845 and 1900, you have the age of science and the rise of hoax, fun, art, and myth around mer people. People don't believe in mermaids as much anymore. Why does this happen? Well, just to skim over this quickly. An Englishman named Captain Edis uh, buys a mermaid specimen from the far, the East Asia, Japan in 1822, brings it back to Great Britain, argues that he has that, he, he wants people to come see it, the Turf Coffee House in London. People flood to see it, but what they see when they go see, to see it is here, you have these two depictions of it. Not exactly a mermaid of beauty and lore. It's about two feet long. The British Museum in London still holds one of these if you ever want to go see one. Uh, I think they have one too in uh, Hot Springs somewhere I've heard. Now he even invites scientists and doctors to come look at it. You see here a drawing of one from a scientist. The scientists say this is fake. Eventually he's outed. He had spent, he had sold someone else's ship in Japan not his, to buy this mermaid. He goes into debt. Well, by 1844, 1842, sorry, an American named P.T. Barnum buys this same mermaid, makes a ton of money off of it, but is also exposed. By the end of the night, by the, you know, after the mid 19th century, like I said, people don't believe in mermaids anymore. And this is where we kind of have this modern idea of our modern mermaids coming in. Um, I'm not going to, you know, here we have different images of mermaids in classical art. We have, I'm not going to dive in this too much, but the kind of the, the rise of the modern film star mermaid, Annette Kellerman, who was born in 1887, Australian woman who eventually moves to America. Um, often she's an incredible swimmer. Um, she's deemed the perfect woman by the media because her physicality, okay, stars in a number of aquatic films, opens her own movie production business, becomes one of the first mainstream actresses to perform nude on film. And act in various vaudeville shows. One of her most popular characters was English Johnny, in which she performed as, in, in, as a man. So she's really pushing boundaries here, but doing so as a mermaid. So once again, you see these shifts. Um, sex always sells. By the early 20th century through the, through the late 20th century, you have mermaids uh, donning everything from Chicken of the Sea, which they still do. Films like Splash in the 80s. Uh, films like Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid and Miranda, which both come out in 1948 very different depictions of mermaids, which I can get into more. And here you have an early advertisement for Schweppes Table Waters, um, 1920s, um, late 19 teens in London. All very kind of sexualized images of mermaids. And finally, to wrap up, my final chapter is about these global waters. And this has been absolutely fascinating as well. So my first chapter, look at mer people through this Western lens largely. In the sixth chapter, I broaden my scope and temporal, temporal and geographic scope. Uh, a few examples I found. On your left here, these are um, ancient prehistoric cave paintings in the South African Karoo Desert of Mer people. On the right, on the top left of that, is a ancient uh, recreation of ancient Native American picto pictographs. On the top left, there is um, Migun, who was one of their uh, gods, who was depicted as a merman. Henry Schoolcraft, an American. Uh, recreated these in the late 19th century. You also have a Japanese Nino figure here. Um, on the top right, you have a Narmakara figure from the Middle East. This is from the first century BCE with the, you see the spread twin tails there. And then you have a bronze plaque of Oba of Benin, African. Uh, this is, his legs are kind of mud puppy fish, a symbol of the sea god Olokun. So you have this you have people who weren't necessarily interacting throughout the world this time, all depicting mer people and depicting them in similar ways with this, this twin tail siren idea that you saw, we saw in the very beginning. So to wrap this up, I guess I did kind of get through all of this. I could have gone way into more depth than all of these. From alleged sightings to merchandising to self-expression, mer people continue to challenge humankind's perception of person and place, I argue. Importantly, mer people seem to become more human over time as we instill our own hopes and shortcomings on these fantastical hybrids. As the lines between humans and mer people continue to blur, our own hybridity will become more apparent. Monstrous yet beautiful, mysterious yet predictable. Humans and mer people are not as different as many like to think. All right, and I'd love to answer any questions now. I got through a lot there, but I hope that gives you a lot to think about as well. well thank you so much, Vaughn. Uh, we had a, an answer about hot springs in which somebody oh. uh, put in the Q&A that the Merman in Hot Springs is at the Alligator Farm, which I don't oh, know that man. much about the Alligator Farm. Uh, I don't either. But I, I have been 
to uh, In Hot Springs uh, for our fans of Maxwell Blade, the magician. Uh, Maxwell Blade has in Hot Springs has this whole oddities area that you can go and check out these sorts of you know oddities like uh, the mer people and shrunken heads and you know uh, and I think that's a great place to begin is uh, was there always this sort of collection of oddities like you saw um, with the collection of mer people or was that something that was uh, specific to a certain time in history? Um, I would say that you really have the boom um, around the 17th, late, early, late 17th, early 18th century. This is when you have this, like I said, this enlightenment period where people are wanting to collect things from all over the world, but not just for collecting purposes, but also to try to understand their place in the world um, and try to kind of create some order and classification. So you go into these the Wunderkommen cabinets of curiosity and you'd find Everything from seashells to unicorns' horns, which are just narwhal tusks, um, but they thought they might be unicorn's horns, to um, Native American artifacts, to dinosaur bones, um, uh, to plants and seeds, um, stuffed animals. Thomas, uh, they're constantly trying to send animals back across the Atlantic. Um, and you can also imagine um, the cultural capital you'd have as a London gentleman not only to, to have things like a mermaid specimen or even some some plant from the Americas that you couldn't have in England otherwise growing in your garden. So it's really around the 17th and 18th century to kind of. We, we have a great question from Mary. Uh, hi, Vaughn, what are the mythical differences between mermaids, the sirens, and silkies? Uh, you talk about this in your book and there's a kind of, a, you speak a little bit about it in relation to Odysseus. Can you go into that for us? Yeah, so in this book, um, Mary, I largely concerned myself. I didn't dive as much into uh, mythical or poetic or um, fables as much around mer people. I was trying. I think that the largest difference I would say difference I would say is selkies, um, sirens. They're largely relegated to the realm uh, throughout most of human history. The realm of kind of fantasy, fable. They're used as uh, teaching devices largely. Um, but what happens starts to begin to happen with mermaids and mermen is they start to be seen more and more as real creatures and not just by different regions of people. They transcend region. They are, they be, somehow any society basically has this pretty uniform idea of this. So, you know, selkies can transform into, you know, human form and things that doesn't happen as much with mermaids. Now there are instances of mermaids like in Holland in the 15th century, an Edam or uh, allegedly a mermaid washed up on shore. They drug her up on shore, taught her how to knit, turned her into a Christian, which is very, um, very imperialist of them, very Christian conversion of them. Um, but that's, I would say the largest difference is the Selkies and sirens to an extent have largely remained in this idea of lore where mermaids had a real boon period where People thought they could be real creatures, just like anything else. Um, and you see that in their depictions. Uh, and feel free, anyone else, to please put questions in the Q&A or in the chat. That the, the story that you just told of pulling the, the mermaid up mm -hmm. and teaching her to knit really speaks to uh, the sexist lean that's gone on throughout mm -hmm. uh, mermaids. But then you do have characters like Annette Kellerman who pop up and uh, mm -hmm. really show in the book uh, during the 20th century that possibly this idea can be taken up by women as a form of female empowerment. Can you talk a little bit about yes. the importance of Annette Kellerman? Definitely. Well, that's what I, that's what I love is that Annette Kellerman begins this idea where she, she embraces her sexuality, um, but she uses it to push back against gender norms. And you see people, that's what's so interesting about mermaids is it's almost like, the, like they carry the mirror, but they can be used by different groups of people and kind of claimed for different purposes. So you definitely, you, uh, the LGBTQ plus community has very much embraced them recently. You have various women who are embracing them to express themselves in various ways. Um, many uh, in the, you know, um, I wouldn't say disabled is not the right word, but the, you know, the different you know, people who maybe struggle, like they can't necessarily walk and things have been able to uh, 
bring in these bring in more people so and you also have them being used now for environmental purposes many men and women are dressing up in merm as mermaid and merman and swimming in rivers and things to express the the, the worry about you know um global warming etc uh, but annette really started that uh because after annette you have women for instance in the film miranda in 1948 miranda pushes back against she uses her her sexuality as a, as a form of power and in the end, not only goes back to the ocean, but takes her child with her that she had with one of the men. So it, it's it's really interesting that Annette Kellerman came on around at the right time. She also, Annette Kellerman was known, she created, she was the first person to wear the modern one piece bathing suit. She got arrested for it at one point, but won, won the legal battle. So yeah, that's where I'd go with that. Uh, we got a ton of wonderful questions pouring in. Uh, I'm going to jump into the Q&A with uh, Alexandria Williams. Do you think the buck stops with mer people or that there is a world of unknown creatures that we interact with? What do you think about the validity of other mythological creatures? Mm -hmm. uh, what's going on with other mythological creatures? Do you think they follow the same line of thought? Alex, that's a great question. Um, and this is the thing, like... I don't have it. Okay, so I'm going to answer this in two parts. They are part of a much larger spate of the wondrous creatures throughout human history. You see everything from, you know, sea serpents to dragons to, um, I don't know, you know, headless people, um, multi headed people in the new world, centaurs, blah, blah, blah. The thing about mer people, though, is that pe the descriptions and depictions people have given of them, sometimes I say, like, what are they seeing? I got I still haven't figured that out because the way they're describing them and they're otherwise very smart people I always wonder what they're seeing and I don't have an answer for it I don't know and that sometimes I think that's the best answer and that and I think that's what enchants us still a lot about mer people is that there are all these these depictions of them and supposed supposed sighting never mind that we've only explored five percent of the ocean and that always kind of leaves that possibility in there we're always discovering finding new weird stuff in the ocean um, and I would also kind of just to, we're still looking for, literally and, and figuratively, we're still looking for mermaids now. In the 18th century, looking for mermaids was the equivalency today, looking for pushing into space, thinking about multiple dimensions, discovering possibilities of life on Mars. So we're still pushing the boundaries of our scientific, philosophical, human knowledge. And I think that, especially in the 18th century, but even at this point today, mer people are kind of these ideal lenses through which to do that. Uh, another great question from Blake. Do you see any parallels between the historic search for mer people and modern day people looking for Bigfoot? This seems to be what you were talking about. What's yeah, searching for something yeah. beyond mind. I do. And the thing though is that, especially in the 17th and 18th century, it would be like if all of a sudden Bill Gates came out and said, I think mer people exist and we need to go find them. Because the, it, these searches for mer people, they were, they were, the Royal Society of London was taking questions and the, these Royal Societies of Sweden, they were being uh, some of the smartest men in the world in the early modern period were chasing mermaids around. Now, that's not me saying people who look for Bigfoot or stupid or something. That's not what I'm saying at all. Rather, the institutional support it had was pretty incredible. And that's one of the things that blew my mind in this. Uh, we have a question from Sean Williams. What are your thoughts on the mermaids as child swappers? And what might relate to the role of mermaids to be feared versus enticing? So child swappers in that they're 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 take they're taking children. They're taking the children. I believe this is a, a part of a, a sort of uh, Asian mythology yeah. of where people. It makes perfect sense though, and it makes perfect sense that they would transcend that. And I think that beyond just the Christian church's representation of mermaids as these dangerous creatures, that uh, I think okay, so. I have a healthy at best fear of the sea because I grew up in the middle of Kansas. Um, I love going to the ocean, but if I swim too far out, I just get scared and start swimming back. Humans though, have always had a close connection with the sea. And I think a healthy fear of the sea, um, you know, um, the, the uh, classic Scottish sweaters, I'm trying to think of the, the sweaters with the intricate patterns. I have one, I can't think of the word of it, but each family had different patterns because when the men would die at sea, when they washed up a, on shore, they could be able to identify them because they had that sweater on. Um, the human voice health. 
and this sense of wonder with the sea. And I think that mer people, whether in Asia or in Western Europe, can kind of represent this, not just fear though, but also this connection, this kind of hybridity where we fear it, yes, we're also part of it. And so that's what's so interesting about them is they're half human, half fish. So they're just as human as they are fish. And that's what you, they're just as human as they are a monster. It's not that simple. They're not just like a dragon where they're a monster. The half human side really says something. Um, so I would, I would just say that I think that this idea of child swapping goes to the fear, but I think also that the fact that they want your child shows their human side as well. And I think that that's what makes them important is the human side. But continuing on this uh, uh, non-Western focus, we have uh, Arshia Khan. Thanks for such a great talk, Vaughn. I'm from Southeast Asia, Pakistan, and remember my grandmother recounting ancestral stories of mer people. Can you tell us a little more about mermaids and non-Western cultures and how they are viewed? Uh, this is a big yeah, portion of your book. Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, human cultures throughout time and space have had their own versions of mer people. They always didn't ascribe to Western ideas. For instance, I showed that Nino image where it was just kind of a human face, but like a fish. Um, and they, they take on all sorts of forms. In Russia, they have the Rusalki, who are these water spirits, basically, who they are pro-women. They won't hurt women. They come after men. But it's they're also very much based around um, femininity, uh, reproduction. What starts to happen, including um, in areas like Pakistan, is that, um, well, you, you have also in like 3,000 Nights, what's sorry, 1,000 nights, you have the different mer people in there, sorry. Um, but what I found that what starts to happen is that as different cultures come into contact with Western cultures, they start to adopt more of this Western idea of what a mermaid looks like into their classical conceptions. So in my book, I have in, in Thailand, there's an instance of, and this incredible, um, if I can find it here, that's uh, uh, not blown up as much as I'd like, but uh, you could see it in the book. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so this is in India. I'll give you the Indian example of, you know, a Vishnu kind of represented as a mermaid. You have the same thing in Thailand. You can't see it as well. So by the 17th, 18th centuries, um, well, here's an example from um, Japan with a, with a mermaid. So as these different cultures come into contact, it's not because Westerners force them on it, on them. It's just the fact that cultures throughout human history have borrowed and shared from each other. That's part of it. And you see that with mer people, that they've taken some of these images and put some of them, actually, after all, Europeans start bringing Nino back with them. And that changes the way Europeans start to represent mer people as maybe more of these kind of little creatures and beasts. We have two great questions in the Q&A, but I have to... Uh... Uh, show the big surprise we have for Vaughn today, in which Vaughn, for you, we have caught an actual mermaid. Uh, and <laughs> we would like to uh, welcome Brittany Sparkles. Brittany Sparkles uh, from Central Arkansas is an underwater artist whose costumes and designs have been enjoyed throughout the state. Uh, Brittany joins us to discuss mer people as entertainment and throw in uh, her own questions as well. So uh, here's Here's the, here's the validity for you, Vaughn. I, know, I see it. I've, I'm convinced. There we go. I need to rewrite this book for a new chapter. About how they're real. Hi. Uh, Brittany, as an, as an entertainer, as someone who, uh, as Vaughn talks about, as you know, the belief in uh, mer people went away, the entertainment rose up. As an entertainer who takes on this sort of figure, what can you tell us about uh, the amount that you swim underwater and how you came to uh, start performing and choosing this sort of way to perform? Oh, well, gosh, see my whole roots as a Merson, as I like to say, um, started when I was a child. I have always been so fascinated with the ocean, aquatic life, and um, swimming, um, ever since I was a child, I was raised on a lake and I would just spend so much time underwater and I would pretend to be friends with the fish and I would just like mentalize that, that I lived there and I was so at peace and comfortable underwater. And um, 
growing up, I was inspired by the performers at Wiki Wachi Springs. I found out that there was a theme park where mermaids swam in a tank all day long. And that's what they did for a living. And at a very young age, I decided that's what I want to do when I grow up. But my own mermaid journey has been so much more than just aiming to swim in the tank someday. That was the ultimate goal, but it all just started with a tail, with a very cheap tail. And I started putting myself out there for birthday parties. And then I realized that, like Vaughn was saying, um, it became a part of like a big part of my self-expression. Um, I can express myself through this things, character that I am so connected with, that I, I just feel so in tune with, um, the magic that I bring to kids when I meet them at parties or events, it lights my heart up. It makes me very happy. And um, gosh, I was so inspired by Annette Kellerman as well. Just the fact that she, you know, could be a man, a woman, a water creature, whatever she wanted, like that is ultimately like my big dream as well. And I just, I went on this journey and ended up where I am now. Now I do birthday parties, um, events. I, anytime a mermaid is needed, I show up. Um, I started doing the mermaid thing, like performing as a mermaid in 2014. And I started with just a really cheap tail. And now I've got like seven tails, really expensive tails to casual tails. Um, a tale for every event. And I find I'm personally connected with each tale. And I just wanted to say, I actually bought this, this book um, in preparation oh, for today. You. And I have enjoyed reading it so much. I have been so very connected with the history. I just yeah. learned so many amazing things through this book. I want to read it again, because I feel like oh. um, my mind was just racing as I was reading it. and. I know if, when I read it again, I will um, realize things that I didn't realize the first time. But the history, I'm just so glad you put it into words and the, the pictures, the timeline of it all just made so much sense to me and I felt so connected to it. I appreciate Good. it so much. I'm going to recommend it to all my mermaid friends. Yes, yes, please do. Yes. I loved well, it. There are so many more. It's incredible how. It, do you have a big community of, of mermaiders that you con? Are you on like message boards or? Because I know there are a lot. Oh yes, you can. Don't even get me started on the mermaid community. I know mermaids in every single state across the country. I know mermaids in other countries. I know mermaids around the globe. And um, like there is a huge community of mer people, mersins. Um, of all genders, races, types, and um, there can be a lot of drama within the community, uh, as within any community. <laughs> but there's also a lot of support, and we all um, connect with each other on just being so comfortable in this thing that is beyond us. You know, yes. I, why I love being a mermaid is has always been a little beyond me, but I've always felt so at home when I do it. I also spend a lot of time underwater. I train underwater every week, once or twice a week, and I free dive. I'm I'm into the whole lifestyle. Awesome. That's really cool. And another Annette Kellerman. There we go. So she, I mean, she's one Annette of my Kellerman moms. was awesome. I I, someone needs to make a movie about Annette Kellerman. Oh she's my gosh. Awesome. I would audition in a heart. It would, yeah. I mean, you could make such a good movie. All the things she did, she was incredible. Yeah, I surprised someone hasn't. Speaking of Annette Kellerman, we have another question about Annette Kellerman. Uh, Vaughn, do you think that the overall perspective of mermaids has completely shifted from the vanity and dangers of the female flesh to one of female empowerment, or is it somewhere in between? That's a great, another great question, Alex. I would say that it it's shifted more to empowerment and advocacy. But you still, I mean, I'm sure that there's still some some of the ideas of like vanity, sexualization that goes into it. I'm, I'm, I know there is. Um, you know, one only has to watch the film The Lighthouse that came out with Robert Pattinson recently, which was just a certain scene in that. Um, so it's still definitely there. Um, 
And the interesting on that too, Alex, is that when The Little Mermaid came out in 1986 or eight, I can't remember. I loved it when I was a kid. I had a Little Mermaid button I wore in my jacket, um, which I guess that's on my roots, the Little Mermaid, with the Mermaid stuff. There's a lot, there's a lot of post-feminist theory that came out that was really attacking it um, and kind of arguing that viewed in a certain way that, you know, the Little Mermaid almost could be viewed as a horror film, horror film in some ways. Painful transformation, losing her voice. There's an evil witch that she has to fight against. And so it, it spurred though the conversation in many ways. So mermaids have also helped spur this post-feminism, pro-feminism movement in thinking about. So even in, even in them saying, well, Ariel was too sexualized, it gave them a chance to kind of fire fire some cannonballs over Disney's bow and think and think about it in this way. So, yeah. And we have a new Little Mermaid movie coming out where the Little Mermaid is a non-white person, which is great. People were acting weird when that happened. And there, someone wrote a great piece in the New York Times about how there have been black mermaids forever. It's not like what Brittany was saying. It's not just this white woman, this mer people. Anyone can be a mer person. And, you know, it's, it's even problematic to necessarily ascribe gender to mer people because it's not that simple. And that's what's, they're so inclusive. And I think that that's really great too. We have a question for Brittany. This comes from Wyndham Wyeth. Uh, Brittany, was there anything about mer people that you learned from Vaughn's book that might influence your performance and the way that you think about performing as a merson going forward? Oh gosh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, just in the first chapter, reading about the roots um, of mermaids in the Christian church and the medieval, medieval times and how um, mermaids were depicted as evil sirens and you know, their tails can be hide under the water and above the water is the illusion of a beautiful creature that lures you in closer and she's actually going to bring you to the depths to your death. I just, just this morning, I made an Instagram post that was highly inspired by, by that chapter. Um, yeah. And I actually mentioned, and I, cause I just this past weekend, I did a photo shoot that was inspired by that. Um, half of my face is what I like to say mutated from the water. And um, in my caption, I wrote how the siren is dangerous because she has the ability to hide her tail in the water and turn her face just so so you cannot see her the mutation and as she uh, approaches she captures you and brings you down and the whole time i was designing the look and everything i was thinking of the, the that chapter in specifics uh, the very first chapter book um i just think it there's just so much um the annette kellerman chapter also once again just completely inspired me. Um, anytime I'm reminded of everything she's done and accomplished, I feel very motivated to just keep being myself and doing my thing. Well, I have a quick couple of questions on that too. Okay, so well, one, a comment. It's probably interesting for you to read this book and that you're you're part of a long line of people beyond Annette Kellerman who have performed in Mermaids as tanks. I mean, you go back to Hen Henry Phillips in the late 19th century, an Englishman, as a, a woman performing as a, as a mermaid. Now, people knew she wasn't a real mermaid at that point, but people were still attracted to her at the aquarium. Uh, you have an instance of a woman being forced to perform as a mermaid in Rome in the 19th century that's uncovered. That was a bad one. We don't want that. But I also wonder, do you ever want to, would you ever want to perform as like kind of an evil mermaid, like a siren, like someone who's like not necessarily good? Because you're, oh, you look like a nice that, one. Um, but, like mermaid sparkles my main mersona is a very uh -huh. colorful uh friendly mermaid uh from the rainbow riviera but nice. i also as a person as uh, i love everything dark and horror related and mm -hmm. um, as an actress and as a performer i've actually done a lot of horror films in the past and okay. i'm usually the monster or i've the the girl that gets killed <laughs> but um <laughs> just the whole siren side of being a mermaid is so intriguing to me. And um, I've almost started branching out and just creating this whole new persona for myself that is separate from mermaid sparkles that's darker and, yeah. you know, spookier, more mysterious because being a mermaid is all, you know, being mermaid sparkles is fun and rainbows and sunshine and spreading joy and magic to the kids. 
but I also really love to embrace that darker side, the, the, the roots, you know, back mm -hmm. to the roots of, of uh, where the, where mermaids were first, how they were seen back where it all began. And it just fascinates me. And so, yes, as a performer, I definitely uh, would love to embrace that. Um, and also, real quick, a side note, you had uh, mentioned how, you know, sex sells. And I don't know if you are familiar with merlesque, but it is no. a form of burlesque that is mermaid oriented. There you and go. I actually have performed that on nice. stage in the past. I'm in, I'm, I have my own burlesque troupe, and I will occasionally embody a mermaid and perform merlesque, which is basically a strip tease, um, it's not extremely sexualized, but slightly sexual, subtly sexualized, and where I eventually I shed my tail and I become a human at the end. And I try my lot of different variations to do it, but merlesque is something that is becoming uh, more apparent in the mermaid community. And so that kind of taps into how mermaids are still sexualized so um, yeah. modernly, modernly, but also that sexualization of mermaids is empowering women now yes yes so we're kind of embracing that and taking that power and using it to our advantage now <laughs> i love it that's really cool we have a uh, we have one more question before we start wrapping up this is from uh david welke uh, it seems that the rise of science in the form of navigation technology and biology natural philosophy facilitated the widespread belief in mermaids do you see an inflection point where science contributed more to debunking the existence of mermaids than it did to encouraging a belief in them? Yeah, Dave, great question. Um, yes, uh, second half of the 19th century. So scientists who were, were really coming out, blades exposed against Captain e Edis and P.T. Barnum. And they were getting so angry when Edis came out because they're like, this is fake. They were doing these things where they were showing how, the, how mermaids were made. Um, they were running these pieces in newspapers where they like go interview these Japanese craftsmen and, and then some who would now live in like New York City. And they're like, look, this is how these fake mermaids are made. They're fake. They start mocking, they actually mock um, Darwin for his ideas of evolution because they're like, according to what you're saying, mermaids could be real. And we know that's not true. Interestingly though, as this is happening, so you have this peak at the end of the 19th century where everyone's like, mermaids are fake. We know this. We've arrived at this new science where we can get to this point. However, by the 1950s, 60s, it kind of starts to swing back a little bit. Um, one of the uh, one book, a history book, a scientific history book on people, ends by saying, well, we don't really know still if people exist. We know that some humans are still born with the faint traces of gills or web feet. They also mention that off the coast of England, where they're saying they're seeing these mermaids, manatees and dugongs can't go that far north. The water's too cold. So what are people seeing? And so they're, they're almost saying like, science says this isn't real, but they're bringing back that kind of possibility again. And I think you kind of, you're gonna see that more and I, because I think that humans, especially with like coronavirus and everything going on, we're more open to the kind of what, who knows? I mean, the New York Times or the CIA released, released you know, confirmation that there are these UFOs. That doesn't mean they're aliens, but UFOs flying around that they just can't explain. And we're all just like, eh, okay, fine. Where if that's the case. And so I think we're, we're more kind of open to the myth now a little bit more than we were. So I, I think, I guess, to wrap that up, the rise of science doesn't have to mean the decline of interest in wonder and myth. And I think we're, we're going to see that more and more. Uh, I, this without a doubt has been the most enjoyable panel I've ever done oh, thanks, uh, as a part of the festival. This book has been the most enjoyable book. It's full of, uh, philosophy, science, entertainment, cultural anecdotes. I cannot recommend this enough. Uh, if you see in the chat, you can see a link where you can purchase this through Cal's, uh, Thank you so much to Vaughn, our author, and Mermaid Sparkles for being a part of the panel. Uh, you would be hearing a round of applause right now. Uh, standing ovation, uh, swimming ovation, spins from the mermaids. Uh, thank you so much. I do want to call everyone's attention to at 4 p.m. Uh, there is the Tasty Reads. 
that you can go check out. It's uh, the contest for uh, food related adaptations of works. And then at 530, we have our fun filled hour of fest related games and trivia that you can find at cows.org, more information. Uh, with that, I wanna give uh, uh, Mermaid Sparkles any conclusions about uh, what you see as the, the future of Merlesque and mermaid performances? Uh, I definitely see mermaid performance evolving. Um, I'm evolving as a mermaid performer every every day. Um, I see I see um, it, it's more evolving into becoming. I like to describe it as underwater drag with a circus art twist, because you have to be able to hold your breath for a long time. You have. To I think we got Brittany dropped out. No. No. Well, I had a she, question for her. She headed back to the water. Um, she did. She back <laughs> in. The siren song. Damn it. Uh, okay. Formats, mermaids. Let's oh, good. see the songs underwater. Mermaids coming up with choreography underwater. Longer breath holds, more intricate costumes. It's growing. It's becoming more colorful and, and grander every year. And so is, so am I as a mermaid. Like if you look at me now versus seven years ago, I'm a, I'm a whole new mermaid. And I love, I love the mermaid I've become and the mermaid that I'm going to become. So I see it definitely evolving into a lot more and I'm excited to see where that goes in the future. Well, and Brittany, where can we see you perform? Do you like to ever do like public events or anything? Oh, yes. Well, since the whole COVID thing happened, 2020 has been a bust for me when it comes to yeah, public events. I was doing an underwater live stream for a while um, from my pool in my backyard, but now that the weather is colder, I had to cl close my pool down. Um, for, for now, I'm through the winter seasons. I just do a lot of underwater training and I post my training clips on my Instagram. Um, if I ever do a live event, or anything like that. I try to. I post it on my Instagram. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Miss Mermaid Sparkles. That's M I S S Mermaid Sparkles. I'm also on Facebook, Facebook.com/slash Mermaid Sparkles. Um, you can keep up with all my stuff there. Um, I'm training and working towards that big goal, that big dream of mine of someday finding my tank to swim in. I um, have had opportunities in the past to swim in tanks. And for some reason, it has always fallen through, but I've been training for years to do it. Someday I'll, I'll be in a tank. So that's the awesome. ultimate goal. <laughs> Perfect. Bon, I want to give you the final word uh, for a takeaway for uh, mer people. Uh, how, how do we conclude thinking about mermaids or do we? I don't think we do because, uh, well, I would conclude is just, just keep your eyes open. I always joke about this. They really are everywhere. Um, you see, their ubiquity and their hybridity is what makes them so fascinating. And you're only gonna see them more and more. You, you, the, the, the way people represent them, um, I think that tells us as much about us as it does them. And I don't know, we're, we're still looking for mermaids, like I said, just in various guises, and we're still fascinated with them and that's not gonna change. And I, I've written the book and I'm still interested. I'm, I still have a mermaid alert, Google alert that comes up on my email every day. So. Just, just just keep looking for them and see what when you find them, how you react and what you think that can tell you about the world we live in. So yeah. Thanks so much saying. everyone who joined us. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the Six Bridges Book Festival and enjoy the last day and all the other events that are still going on today. Thank you, Vaughn, and thank you, Mermaid Sparkles. Uh, have you. a wonderful day on land. <laughs> thank you.